Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, coming out tonight. It's great to see such a large crowd. Uh, so, yeah, we've all been introduced. I'm just going to flick onto the next slide, which shows uh, the group of researchers, our collaborators, partners, and funders of the research that we'll be presenting tonight. So, as you can see, a very um, large group there. Um, all the, virtually all the New Zealand universities are working with us on the Hikarangi Subduction Zone and about 20 different overseas research institutes and universities. And um, I think this, this big crowd of logos out there just reflects the interest in, um, in the research that we undertake in New Zealand, but also the, um, the global implications that we, the sort of things that we can learn from the Hikarangi subduction zone that are applicable to other subduction zones worldwide. So today I'll be starting off, I'm talking about past earthquakes and tsunamis on the Hikarangi subduction zone. I'll be passing then to Alan Orpin, who will be talking about um, some offshore research, so how we look at past earthquakes from the sediment records offshore. Uh, Laura Wallace and Dan Bassett are going to take us on a more geophysical bent, looking at present day behaviour of the Hikarangi subduction zone and seismic imaging of the subduction zone. And then, as Kate mentioned at the end, we'll have a Q&A. &A. So, yes, are we talking about past earthquakes and tsunamis on the Hikarangi subduction zone, which is, as it mentions, New Zealand's largest fault. So I'm just going to start off with some, some basics about subduction zones. So subduction zones are where one tectonic plate subducts beneath another. And where we are right here, we're on the Hikarangi subduction zone. So this is where the Pacific plate bends underneath and subducts westward beneath the Australian plate. Um, the subduction starts right out at the Hikarangi trough, which is a couple of hundred kilometres offshore from where we are here. And where we are at the moment, the Pacific plate is about 15 kilometres beneath us. Uh, to the south, the Hikarangi subduction zone turns into a transform plate boundary at the Alpine Fault. And to the north, it just carries on and changes into the uh, Kermadec and Tonga subduction zones. So just to place some context on why we are so interested in earthquakes and um, subduction zone behaviour here at the Hikarangi subduction zone, this slide, the, the white and yellow dots show earthquakes larger than magnitude 6 over the past couple of decades around the Pacific Rim. So these highlight the, um, the edges of the Pacific Plate and where subduction zones are. And those red stars show very large and significant subduction earthquakes. And as you can see, there's some really notable ones there, like 1960, uh, 1960 in Chile, 9.3, the Tohoku earthquake in 2011 up in Japan, the Sumatra, the Indian Ocean earthquake, the 9.3 in 2004. And what we have is this question mark here around New Zealand. So we have not had any really large subduction earthquakes in our historic record. So this is the, the European written um, historic record. So one of our main research drivers is, um, why is that? Is it because we're not prone to them? Is there reasons about our subduction zone that we don't generate very large subduction earthquakes? Or is it just that we haven't seen it yet and we're, um, it's building up for something in the future? So, why do we care in particular about subduction zone earthquakes? It is because of the size of them. So subduction zones produce the largest earthquakes on Earth. And because they typically shift a large amount of the seafloor, they also generate the largest tsunamis in the world. So this um, little pie chart here shows global earthquake energy release, and as you can see, by far the majority of energy release is released at, by earthquakes at subduction zones. So, here on the Hikarangi subduction zone, we currently have very little understanding of the tsunami and earthquake hazard of our subduction zone. Um, and we believe that by understanding more about this, so having more knowledge, we can have better preparedness. So, just to carry on with that, theme of subduction earthquakes on the Hikarangi subduction zone. As I mentioned, we haven't had any large subduction earthquakes, and I just wanted to highlight here, when I talk about the subduction interface, I'm talking about earthquakes that occur between these, on this red line, sort of between these two plates. So this is also sometimes called the megathrust. 
Um, so we have had some small, these red dots show past earthquakes in our historic record on the Hikarangi subduction interface. Um, the largest that we've had was magnitude 7.2 up here just offshore of Poverty Bay in 1947. The rest of those red dots are sort of magnitude 5s and 6s. So nothing really significant. Um, what we have had in abundance in historic times, of course, is um, earthquakes on upper plate faults. So upper plate faults are these ones that slice through the plate overlying the subduction, uh, subduction interface. So they're entirely within this Australian plate. So in 1931, the Nape, uh, Hawke's Bay earthquake, that was an example of an upper plate fault earthquake. Uh, similarly, 1855, a Wairarapa earthquake, and also the recent 2016 Kaikoura earthquake was dominantly an upper plate fault earthquake. So the Hawke's Bay 1931 earthquake, as I mentioned, it wasn't a subduction earthquake. It occurred on a fault, a reverse fault within the Australian plate. Um, at depth, probably at about 30 to 40 kilometres, that fault does join with the subduction interface. Um, and the one thing I wanted to mention about this very well-known earthquake is um, this is about Ahuru Lagoon. So Ahuru Lagoon in 1931, that uplifted by about one to one and a half metres. The geological record, which is what I'll talk about a bit later, shows that the dominant movement that we see through geological history, so over thousands of years, is that that lagoon suddenly subsides. So the main research question that myself and my colleagues are involved with is does the Hikarangi subduction, uh, does the Hikarangi megathrust rupture in great or giant earthquakes? And if so, how often does that occur? So fortunately for us, these very large subduction earthquakes, they do leave a geological signature. Um, parts of the coastline will uplift and parts of it will subside. So by studying the geology and the sediments around the coastline, we can find evidence of these past earthquakes. So this is a um, fairly classic sort of subduction earthquake um, geological signature uh, from Cascadia, which is on the west coast of uh, North America. Uh, we have a land surface here that was formerly forested, so a terrestrial surface. A subduction earthquake occurred there in 1700. Uh, the land, there was a tsunami inundated and left the tsunami sand layer, and the land dropped, and after the earthquake it was infilled with um, marine sediment, so estuarine silt. Um, this is just more examples of this, so these um, ghost forests that appears, so there's one in Cascadia up in Alaska after the um, 9.2 subduction earthquake up there, um, where forests were, um, they were drowned and then died off because of the, um, they went below sea level. Uh, we saw it here from satellite images in Sumatra after the 9.3 there, this island subsided. And here's examples as well from Chile where these layers repeatedly show subsidence of the land. So there's evidence of five earthquakes there in the past 1,000 years. So we also can see evidence of coastal uplift from subduction earthquakes. It's more common with upper plate earthquakes, um, but we do sometimes see it in subduction earthquakes if the land is close enough to the trench. Um, and the sudden coastal uplift will produce a marine terror, so it produces a landform evidence of past earthquakes. And we saw it here very visibly recently in the Kaikoura earthquake, where about 100 kilometres of coastal uplift occurred and large um, new shore platforms were uplifted and they will eventually turn into marine terraces. Very similar to what we see in Northern Hawk Bay up at Mahia Peninsula, where these terraces fringing the peninsula record past earthquakes. So we've been taking study, undertaking studies right along the margin from basically from East Cape right down to Kaikoura, looking for evidence of these past subduction earthquakes. Um, I'm just going to focus for the next few slides on what we see around Hawke's Bay. So what we do see is, um, so as I mentioned, Mahia Peninsula, we see uplift out here in the sites closer to the trench. So up here at Mahia Peninsula, Cape Kidnappers, Waimarama and Ocean Beach all show evidence of past earthquake-driven uplift. These sites further inboard, so further landward, um, show evidence of sudden subsidence. So up here, the Wairau Lagoons, Tapaira and Opaho show evidence of earthquake um, driven subsidence. Uh, similarly, as I mentioned, Ahuru Lagoon shows the signature of dropping down in earthquakes. 
and uh, Pakurutahi Valley, which is um, a little bit south of Tongoyo. Uh, that shows evidence of subsiding in earthquakes as well. And these little symbols here, the waves, show sites where we also see evidence um, at the same time as the earthquake of tsunami inundation. And so this just summarises how we look at that evidence of subsidence. Um, we basically, we study these coastal lagoons or areas of the coastline very close to sea level. Um, and we collect sediment cores, so sometimes manually, just with muscle power, sometimes with a big drill rig, preferably. <laughs> um, and then we look, we study these sediments and these cores. We use microfossils to understand things about the past um, environment. So they tell us where sea level was relative to the site through time. And we also undertake a lot of radiocarbon dating to understand the timing of things. And then these all get combined into an earthquake record or a record of land elevation change through time. And this is a, just a summary from one of Bruce Hayward's papers of the earthquake record at Ahuru Lagoon. A subduction earthquake driven uplift studies that we've done around Hawke's Bay. This is just an example from Mahia Peninsula where trenches were dug across these four marine terraces here. And that's an example where we could then look at the beach sediments exposed across those terraces. We collect a lot of um, shells to radiocarbon date and that tells us the timing that those beaches were uplifted and abandoned by the sea. Um, and there's an example as well, not from Hawke's Bay, but right up north of Gisborne, where we recently dug a tre terrace trench across there as well. So from these trenches, we can not only date um, the timing of past earthquakes, but also how much uplift occurred per event, and that can tell us a bit about the magnitude of the earthquake as well. So terrace uplift is often caused by upper plate faults, but as I mentioned, it can be caused by the subduction interface as well. So this just summarises the evidence of past earthquakes and tsunamis that we have from those various sites around Hawke's Bay. Um, this is just a plot, this is time through here, where we are now, back to 8,000 years, and these are the various sites here. The blue indicates a site where the land has gone down, subsided, red, uplift, and the little wave again is the tsunami evidence. So if we do some correlations and also bring in some other evidence as well from other sites, these red bars show when we think subduction earthquakes have occurred in the past. Um, the width of them just reflects the uncertainty on the age dating. Sometimes we can't date things really close to when we think the earthquake occurred, so it's just a bit of uncertainty there. Um, but in summary, about eight subduction earthquakes over the past 7,000 years have impacted Hawke's Bay. So this averages out to a recurrence of about eight to 900 years in between events. Um, and we think the last earthquake occurred around about 500 to 600 years ago. Um, which all sounds, <laughs> sounds positive, the last earthquake 500 years ago, they occur 800 years apart, except earthquakes, we can see from this, are not that well behaved in terms of their timing. So there can be intervals of as little as 200 years between earthquakes, but also stretches of maybe up to two and a half thousand years where nothing happens. So, the key message from this is that earthquakes have occurred and we should really be prepared at any time because we can't really predict when the next one will be. I um, also wanted to just briefly discuss tsunami as well. So when we have these large subduction earthquakes, it deforms a lot of the seafloor and that seafloor deformation shifts the water column and that's what triggers the tsunami. So our geological studies um, record in many places tsunami sediments. So we're quite confident that past subduction earthquakes have triggered tsunamis, and it's very likely that future subduction earthquakes also will trigger tsunamis. Um, for the Hawke's Bay region, the Hikarangi subduction zone is the largest local source of tsunami hazard. And we also wanted to just highlight that so GNS and other colleagues from NIWA and so on, we undertake tsunami modelling, and this incorporates all that we know about all these local sources, so about the subduction interface, all the upper plate faults, um, also everything from regional sources, so sites further away, for example, the Tonga Kermadec Trench, and also distant sources, such as tsunamis coming all the way from South America. This all gets incorporated into how these tsunami evacuation maps are made, and they can be... Um, viewed and downloaded from the Hawke's Bay Emergency website. Um, but what we did want to highlight here is that the subduction zone is very close. So 
but the timing between when an earthquake occurs and when waves start arriving is likely to be too short for um, the issuing of um, <coughs> sorry, um, official warnings. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis on self-evacuation. And the key thing here, the key message, is this long, strong, and get gone. So that's encouraging people if you feel a long earthquake, so about a minute of shaking, or a very strong earthquake, so something where it's quite hard to stand up, um, basically self-evacuate at that point. Don't linger around and wait for an official warning. So to summarise this part of the talk, the Hikarangi subduction zone is one of the few around the Pacific Rim that has not had a large subduction earthquake during historic times. Um, but we can see from the geological record, <laughs> thank you, um, that large subduction earthquakes have occurred in the past. And this means in the future, it's very likely there will be another one. Uh, they're very likely to produce significant amount of coastal movement, so uplift or subsidence, and produce a tsunami as well. Um, our research around the coastline also integrates very closely with work that is being undertaken by Niwa, Victoria and others on the offshore record of past earthquakes. And this is where I'm going to hand over to Alan to talk about that. When I was a geology student, uh, one of the first lessons that I learnt was that uh, uh, Charles Lyell, many years ago, um, said that uh, the Earth was shaped by the same uh, scientific uh, processes uh, that are still in operation today. So in essence, that is that today is the window into understanding the past. It's not often that I would ever agree with Donald Trump um, <laughs> But the other day, he made a visionary statement that the world is a dangerous place. <laughs> um, a, poorly, a poorly constrained question in, in Google uh, takes us to some unusual and scary places. Um, and in fact, took me to the uh, strange new worlds of the geology of Star Trek. Science, too. Um, if we start off with a poorly constrained question, um, can arrive at a situation where we are facing a monster, uh, in this case not unlike the monster that James T. Kirk um, sees before him. My challenge tonight um, is to try and unravel a story where the image on the, the left here of a rather unattractive looking, very muddy core taken uh, in November 2016, with a very soupy, um, fluidised mud at the top and a somewhat darker grey mud underneath. Um, this is one of our um, very senior techs here, not looking very encouraged about uh, being all wet and covered in mud. Bears any resemblance or in fact any relationship to this rather nicer looking core on the right hand side. Um, this core, uh, this is actually a CT image, um, not at all unlike what you would have in a, in a, in a hospital. In fact, the, the um, machinery we, we do use is very similar to what you would see in a hospital. So it's like an X-ray of sorts. The lighter layers are sandier, and when you look at a, a stratigraphic column, this is a stylized geological interpretation of what that core is, we see a series of sandier units, so-called turbidites. So my challenge really is to try and unravel what we have today uh, and how it bears any resemblance to how we interpret the past. Take note of the age at the base of this core, uh, it's just over a thousand years, so we really are transporting back in time. In order to do that, um, we need to have a, a digression into uh, a turbidity current. What is a turbidity current? Well, it's a deposit of bottom flowing um, sediment laden material um, uh, that, that flows along, along the seabed. There are a few things that we need to take note of here. This is actually a, a laboratory experiment, quite obviously, um, uh, and that is uh, to do with sizes and scales. Obviously in this experiment it's highly constrained, we've got something that's in the order of a few metres, um, and uh, the, 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 the early part of the experiment has the turbidity current going down a, a little chute 
It turns out this chute actually is very similar to what might be uh, seen offshore in a, in a, in a uh, submarine canyon. And it spills out into a more sort of open basin-like feature, and this is a good analogy to perhaps what we might see offshore as, the, as mud coming off the, the top of the uh, uh, slope um, falls into a sedimentary basin. The difference is that the scales of things are, of course, are much uh, uh, bigger. Uh, in, in the real world, the height of this very sediment-laden column here might be in the order of 200 metres high. The speed at the turbidity front here might be in the order of many tens of kilometres per hour. So we're dealing with things that are very large and we're dealing with things that have, have got a lot of energy. There's a very turbulent uh, nose on the, on the leading edge of this turbidity current. These turbidity currents lead to the formation of turbidites. So that's the digression of um, uh, learning the, the building blocks of what we see today and how that can help us interpret the past. This is a fairly busy image. This is the uh, Kaikoura Canyon, um, and it's really an amalgamation of a lot of uh, science work that's gone on just in the last year or two. Um, it's a combination of the bathymetry, that is the, our assessment of the water depth, taken before the Kaikoura earthquake, and the bathymetry taken after the Kaikoura earthquake. And there's a lot going on. This, uh, you see Kaikoura Peninsula here. This is the axis of the Kaikoura Canyon sweeping down to the right. The colours indicate where we have loss of bathymetry, uh, and, the light, and the lighter uh, blues are where there's the deposition, the reds are where there's erosion. So if you look at the scale on the right-hand side, some of these red colours would suggest tens of metres of sedimentary loss. Also on the top right in this uh, inset A here, uh, we have uh, the comparison of uh, the shelf edge before the, the, the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016 and after the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016. And there's some pretty obvious differences. Look at the, the amount of landward retreat of these gully heads, indicated here by these arrows. So, and an inset C here, which is down at the base of the Kaikoura Canyon, this is in the, in the order of 1,500 metres water depth, um, there are a, a series of sediment waves, actually we see sort of a, a blow up over here on, on, on the inset here. And what we saw was that these sediment waves were reconfigured after the Kaikoura earthquake. That is to say that their, their crests moved down the canyon. What are these, what are these uh, uh, um, crests made of? They're actually made of gravel. And we, were, we had a, a voyage there in September last year, and you can see this rounded um, gravel, probably originally of alluvial origin from rivers, um, and there's a bit of sort of a, a, a sort of a mud slough that sits on top, but underneath that is a very clean gravel. So these flows, just like we saw on that experiment, these flows are very vigorous, they, have, they are uh, uh, occurring at very high velocities, and they have the capacity to move very coarse material and reconfigure things like uh, sedimentary waves. So what, what in fact have we got here? We have evidence for a very large canyon, so-called a canyon flushing event. How much material did we think was removed? If, because we're dealing with um, loss of sediment here, we can actually calculate the volume, and from volume we can calculate the weight, and we're talking in the order of 850 megatons of sediment, we believe was flushed out of Kaikoura Canyon as a result of that 7.8 earthquake. How much is 850 megatons? It's in the order of two to three times the total riverine output for New Zealand for one year. So we're talking about a lot of material. So if we want to think of a, a, a trigger for a turbidity current, here is a really good example. If we want to understand what's going on today, this is going to be the window into the past. So, how far did this turbidity current go? And there are two sites that I want to focus on. Somewhat serendipitously, we were offshore collecting all these cores in yellow at the time the Kaikoura earthquake occurred. So uh, within a day or so, we, we traversed south and we started to be looking for evidence of the earthquake. And there are two sites that I want to show you. One is the site over here, so-called HIC-21. We always give, these, give them these cute names that only we seem to understand, and in fact we often don't, uh, we forget the names of them when we go, get very confused, but this is HIC-21, and much further to the north, actually just uh, off southern Hawke's Bay, so-called HIC-18. 
So these are associated with this long, sinuous feature called the Hikarangi Channel. So the Kaikoura event flushed into the Hikarangi Channel and a turbidity current flowed along here. Let's see how far it actually went. This is the southern of those two sites, so-called Hik 21, uh, collected on the Tangaroa voyage in 2016. This is a precision multi-corer. It takes very um, a clear, uh, precise samples and is um, an ideal tool to preserve the sediment water interface. The core on the, the, sorry, the image on the left-hand side is another one of these CT scans, it's like an X-ray. The, the image on the right of that is a, is a photograph. And right at the top, you can see what looks like this pretty fresh-looking uh, material, and that is, in fact, a uh, turbidite that's the remnants of a turbidity flow. Um, how far north of Kaikoura is this? It's about 320 kilometres. How did we actually prove that it was stuff that effectively fell out of the water column yesterday? Well, we used a radioactive nuclide called thorium-234. It is a very sh uh, short half-life of 24 days. So it will only uh, occur in high concentrations at the sediment water interface. So this little graph here on the right-hand side shows that there's a peak in thorium-234 levels below this new deposit. So that's actually pretty strong proof that this was the event directly caused by the, the earthquake. Other bits of evidence are, this is iron staining that we see also at the sediment water interface, and this was, this was buried below the co-seismic event, and also we saw broken um, uh, um, biology. This is a mechanoderm that's been broken apart that was also buried. So pretty compelling evidence that something pretty major had happened. Let's go to that northern site now, the Hikarangi, uh, the, this pairing actually, Hik 16 and Hik 18. Again, there's cute names coming through. And there's two cores. So this is the core from within the channel axis. Um, and you can see this elaborate sort of banding here of the sandier coarser base. This is like a classical so-called turbidite with a sandy base that grades up into finer material. But the total thickness of this is over 60 centimetres. On the channel levee, this is Hik 16, you can see a much smaller deposit. So the difference between the, the axis of the channel and the channel levee gives us an indication of how high that turbidity cloud was. And so it was in the order of 200 metres high. How far away from source was this? This was over 650 kilometres. So there's a pretty widespread effect of an earthquake that happened in Kaikoura traversed all that distance. So these are very long, um, persistent features, and it may in fact have gone all the way through the full length of the channel, the full 1,500 kilometres. That's pure speculation, but clearly it was a big event and was obviously still very vigorous in the channel axis, so many hundreds of kilometres downstream. Did we see evidence of other turbidites forming more locally? Well, we did. This, these are some other cores we collected in the middle of last year. And this is from Cook Strait. That's the uh, sort of Cape Palace area just down through here, southern Wairarapa through here. And this, these are some cores from Cook Strait. And you can see, again, this, this sort of repeated pattern of these little banded turbidites just in the order of two or three centimetres thickness in this case. And there's an example here where this is a really um, shell-rich hash that's been remobilised and flushed down through and, uh, and it's deposited in the base of um, uh, this Cook Strait um, tributary here. So not only did we get the, uh, the effect of a turbidity current that flowed down the channel, but we also had localised deposits formed from ground shaking. So again, this, this speaks to the, uh, the very broad effect um, that these sorts of earthquakes happen, uh, these sorts of earthquakes, um, uh, what, what they trigger. And this is a window into understanding the past. So then, let's go back to the challenge. And I've, I've, I've changed the label here because it's really our challenge. It's my challenge, it's the challenge of my colleagues, and it's your challenge too because ultimately you're funding this research. So um, the challenge for us really collectively is to understand what happened uh, with the Kaikoura event and then to be able to use that to reinterpret what happened in the past. Now not all turbidity currents are formed from earthquakes, but we know from our other experiences that a good many of them uh, do. And the other issue, of course, is timing. How do we actually know when exactly this occurred in time? And then, and Kate talked to this with her um, uh, uh, online evidence. We, we need really good age models. We need lots and lots of carbon dates. And offshore, we need to use 4AMs for those things. 
So for the next year or two, that's what, we, that's what we're doing. We're actually going to start looking at the, the chronology of these cores and st start to try and tease out how often do these, these cores occur through time. And from that, we can get an understanding of the frequency of events. How, how many uh, earthquakes may we have recorded offshore? So go, to go back to the, the future and the strange new worlds, I'm actually pretty heartened because I've, I, the monster that's ahead of us is actually a pretty snappy dresser. So that's encouraging. So what have we learned? What have we learned about, uh, uh, about all this? Well, the Kaikoura event triggered a major canyon flushing event. Um, and, and this really has given us a window into understanding the past in, in, a more, in an almost unprecedented way. Uh, we know it liberated millions of tonnes of, of material and generated a turbidity flow that traversed several hundreds of kilometres. It also, the Kaikoura event also triggered local um, uh, uh, turbidity currents that were smaller, and these are captured in all those sedimentary basins that we've got an elaborate and very deep library of cores for now. So there's a good chance that we can unravel those to try and establish the frequency of turbidites. Now, I'm very careful about the way I say that because I'm not saying the frequency of earthquakes. That's, a, that's a, an outcome that is still some, some time away. But nonetheless, as I point out in point three there, we have a rich turbidite history um, that we hopefully we can use to unlock um, uh, the frequency of triggers over many thousands of years. And just as we, uh, as we focused on in the first slide, understanding the frequency of, the, of these events um, will give us an understanding of the frequency of earthquakes and help us predict the future. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to drag you guys out of the past and we're going to get back to the present here. And I want to talk to you all um, a, a little bit about what we know about what is currently happening on the Hikarangi subduction zone. Um, so just to remind you again, we're looking at this, what's really New Zealand's largest and most rapidly moving and most active plate boundary fault um, that's lying about 15 kilometers beneath our feet. Um, we're talking about the, Kate called it the mega thrust. Um, I like that name too, I, I'll stick with that. But I want to talk a little bit about what this fault is actually up to these days. Um, so how, what kind of tools can we use to figure out what is happening on this big plate boundary fault right now? Well, one of the main tools that we've been using for you know, the last 15 years or so is global positioning system data. So this is actually GPS measurements of the movement of the land. Um, we've been taking these kinds of measurements um, at many, many sites in the North Island, of, Island over the last 20 years, and we can see how different parts of the North Island are moving relative to each other. And the reason that this can tell us about what the Hikarangi subduction zone is doing is because when these two plate boundary faults come together, um, there often there are places along the fault where there's a lot of friction, and the two plates can't slip past each other because of that friction, sort of like rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together. But the bigger plates are still moving in the far field because you can't stop plate tectonics, so you get a lot of contraction and distortion of the Earth's crust around that locked area. And we can actually measure that at the ground surface and, and measure that contraction and distortion and use that to kind of map out where the plate boundary is creeping steadily without building up stress and pressure and where it's actually stuck and building up stress that could be relieved in future earthquakes. So this figure on the left, this is kind of showing, that's the North Island there, this is showing a sort of a map view of the plate boundary uh, beneath the North Island. That three kilometer contour out there to the east, that's, that's out near the trench where it surfaces at the trench and then that bottom end there goes down to about 70 kilometers um, on, this, on this map here. But what these colors are showing, the red areas are showing where the GPS is suggesting that the plate boundary is actually locked up. It's currently stuck um, and it's building up a lot of stress and pressure and then eventually one day so much stress is gonna build up that it will overcome the strength of the fault and it'll rupture suddenly in an earthquake. So in the south here beneath the Wadadapa region and the Wellington region, we have this big stuck patch. If that ruptured at once in a single earthquake, we could be looking at a magnitude eight or an eight and a half, so quite a big event. So this is something we're really um, very concerned about and um, a lot of Kate Clark and others work um, is giving us a, a big window into how often that ruptures in the past as well. 
We have a big change when we go to the north um, in the Hawke's Bay region and the Gisborne region. We don't see as much evidence for this stress building up. We see a, more of a, a steadily creeping um, plate boundary sort of over the last 20 years or so. Although there's probably, particularly in the offshore area, some stuck patches that we can't really resolve very well with the onshore GPS. Okay, so one of the other things that um, we've been doing a lot of work on um, that the, the Hikadangi subduction zone has been showing us through GPS um, is work on these things called slow slip events. How many, how many, I just want to see how many people have heard of slow slip events? You guys are awesome. <laughs> East Coast Lab, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, so slow slip event, it sounds like most of you already are, are, know what these things are, but they're really similar to earthquakes. So as most of you know, an earthquake is when two pieces of the Earth's crust slide past each other suddenly, you know, sometimes involving meters of movement in a matter of seconds. You get that sudden seismic energy release and shaking. A slow slip event is like an earthquake, except it's in slow motion. And we like this because you don't get that sudden seismic energy release and shaking. These slow motion earthquakes can involve tens of centimeters of movement over periods of days to weeks to months and sometimes even years. And um, scientists have really only known about these things in the last 15 to 20 years or so. And this is really because of GPS technology. So all around the world, at subduction zones around the world, we have these continuously operating GPS instruments that actually allow us to track the movement of the land at a millimeter level every single day. So we can see changes in how it's moving due to these plate tectonic movements. And so scientists in Canada discovered the first slow slip events um, in the, at the Cascadia subduction zone, the one off of Western North America that Kate mentioned. Um, almost, almost 20 years ago now, and it was because their GPS sites were doing these strange things. They were changing the direction of motion, and they finally realized, wait a minute, there's this big slow deformation event, big slow slip event on the subduction zone there. Since then, we've seen slow slip events really in almost every subduction zone around the world that has GPS capability, including here in New Zealand. Um, we've seen tons and tons of them here, and it's actually become one of the most interesting places to study them. Um, the discovery of these things have actually raised a huge number of questions about how faults actually work and how, how, how earthquakes are generated versus slow slip events. So there, there's a lot of big outstanding questions. And they also, we find particularly in New Zealand, they play a really big role in accommodating the motion between the tectonic plates. So they're a really big player. Um, and they often, in one single slow slip event can involve enough motion that if it had hadn't happened suddenly, like in an earthquake, it would have been a magnitude seven earthquake. So these, we've not known about these things until really about 15 years ago in New Zealand. And um, you know, we've been regularly having what are essentially magnitude seven earthquakes on our subduction zone without even knowing about them. Um, so this, as I mentioned before, GPS is the primary way that we monitor these things. The GeoNet project has built out what is really one of the best subduction zone continuous GPS networks in the world. I would say Cascadia, Japan, and New Zealand are the top three. So that's something I think we should all be proud of and um, love GeoNet even more for that. Um, but since we had this capability, we've observed at least 30 distinct um, slow slip events, probably more. Um, at these GPS sites in the North Island. So this map on the right is a map of the continuous network um, that we have where we can monitor these um, changes in movement on our subduction plate boundary. So the first subduction, slow, uh, first slow slip event we saw in New Zealand was back in October of 2002. And we saw a couple of sites um, near Gisborne actually doing something very strangely. They all of a sudden, so those are, those are time series, GPS time series, so they're the position with time, so x-axis is time, that's over about a month in late 2002, and the y-axis is uh, position relative to the east in millimeters. So the, the sites were just trucking along, and then all of a sudden they took a big jump to the east of about two to three centimeters over about 10 days. And this is very strange. Two to three centimeters may not sound like a lot to you guys, but in plate tectonic context, that's about a year's worth of plate motion. And for that to happen in 10 days, something sort of strange is going on. And we realized that that was actually a slow slip event just offshore Gisborne beneath Poverty Bay. Um, so that was the first one we saw in New Zealand. And since then, um, we've seen tons of them since we have this capability now with GeoNet. 
So this is just to kind of give you a bit of an overview of the slow slope events at the Hikarangi subduction zone. So these green contours here are cumulative slip and slow slip for about a 10 year period between 2002 and 2012. So we see some very interesting patterns here. Um, at the northern Hikarangi subduction zone, our slow slip events, so the coastline of Hawke's Bay is right here. The slow slip events are mostly offshore. They're on that shallower part of the plate boundary, sort of less than 10 to 15 kilometers depth. And you see these are some examples of GPS site movements. Um, this, is, this top one here is up at Mahia. This one right here is at Cape Kidnappers. Um, and you can see normally, like Mahia, for example, is typically trucking along to the west, but occasionally it makes an abrupt movement to the east on the order of a few centimeters. Um, these movements um, in the Hawke's Bay and Gisborne region, are, they happen very fast. They, these slow slope events typically only last a couple of weeks. They happen very frequently, usually about every one to two years. Um, and they're really quite large in the context of slow slip events worldwide and often equivalent to about a magnitude 7 earthquake in terms of the movement that they accommodate. Um, and then at the southern part of the North Island, um, in the Kapiti region and the Manawatu region, we see very different behavior. These are some sites. This is a GPS site at Levin. So you see it's, these are typically trucking along to the west. This is a site at Kapiti Island and this is Durville Island. But then occasionally they'll take this big eastward turn. Um, so these are also slow slip events. This is a slow slip event that happened beneath the Kapiti coast in 2000, uh, 2013. And we see different behavior down here. We see slow slip events only happen in the south down in this area about once every five years. Um, they're very long. They typically last about a year. And they're very large. Um, they're you know, often more than a magnitude 7 earthquake equivalent. So um, this, these, are, um, these ones in the Manawatu and Kapiti region are actually occurring very deep, 20 to 30 kilometers or so, compared to the ones up here, which are occurring at shallower levels. OK, so why do we care about slow slip events? Um, one of the reasons that we care about them is they're happening on this big megathrust fault that can also produce earthquakes. So we really um, you know, want to see, number one, can these slow slip events tell us something about earthquake potential? Um, and also, what is their relationship to earthquake occurrence and time? So one of the things that hopefully some of you guys noticed looking at this map, this is the map of locking I showed you earlier, where the plate boundaries, for example, hung up in the lower North Island. The slow slip in the Manawatu and Southern Hawks Bay and Kapiti region seems to wrap around that. And this is pretty typical of a lot of slow slip areas. The slow slip zones seem to happen in between where the, the plate boundary locks up and slips in earthquakes versus where it's creeping. It's kind of in that transition. So it's sort of mapping out the edges of where the plate boundary is locked up, that sort of dangerous part of the plate boundary. So the, the distribution of slow slip events may actually give us some important insights into where these great subduction earthquakes are more likely. Um, one of the other things that's really important and that actually is um, particularly um, this Hawks Bay region um, has, has given us a lot of insight is we typically observe swarms of smaller earthquakes during these slow slip events that happen off the east coast. For example, off the Hawks Bay region and the Gisborne region. Um, on the left, this is showing um, slip in a slow slip event that um, involved up to 20 centimeters of movement. This is a really big slow slip event just offshore Hawks Bay. There's Cape Kidnappers here and the coastline there um, in February of 2013. And that was accompanied by a lot of earthquakes. Probably a lot of you felt those earthquakes. Um, the largest one in that case was up to a magnitude 5, um, I think, just, just back in here. Um, and then also another great example is following the Kaikota earthquake, we actually had a big slow slip event triggered along the east coast, and that was also accompanied by a swarm of earthquakes off the Parangaho region. Um, in particular, the largest was a magnitude 6, which we think was actually on the megathrust offshore of Parangaho um, during that slow slip event. So these, these earthquakes are probably happening during slow slip because you can imagine as the slow slip is going on, you're redistributing stress into different parts of the crust and potentially loading other faults or loading other parts of the subduction zone and potentially pushing those to failure. So that, that um, it's, it's these stress changes happening during the slow slip events is probably why we tend to have swarms of earthquakes 
during them. There's also an opposite sort of triggering relationship that we um, observed really in a very spectacular fashion following the Kaikota earthquake. Um, was the, the Kaikota earthquake, of course, as everybody know, knows, was down here in the northeastern South Island. Immediately following that, we saw really widespread, large slow slip over most of New Zealand's slow slip regions, including off the East Coast, going all the way from East Cape down to offshore Cape Turnigan and the Kapiti region. And we also saw slip um, on the subduction plate boundary beneath Marlborough after the earthquake. So we think off the East Coast that this slow slip was actually triggered by seismic waves traveling all the way from the Kaikoura earthquake rupture area and, and causing oscillating stresses on the plate boundary that actually triggered the slow slip events. So slow slip events, in addition to, to triggering earthquakes, they can also be triggered themselves by distant earthquakes. So this was pretty um, exciting um, to see and had never really been seen before. Um, so in terms of the relationship between slow slip events and earthquakes, we really need to try and better understand that. Because for example, the Japan uh, 2011 magnitude 9 earthquake, there's a lot of good evidence that that was actually preceded by a large slow slip event and was potentially triggered by that slow slip event. A similar case was also observed in 2014 in Chile. Um, I want to point out, though, we've seen dozens of slow slip events in New Zealand where we haven't seen a large earthquake following it. So certainly, most slow slip events don't trigger big earthquakes. But I think if we can better understand the likelihood of them doing this, we can do a lot better job with our earthquake forecasting in the future. So this is, I think, a big focus of scientists really wanting to pin this relationship down between slow slip events and earthquakes, because it may be one of the best ways to improve earthquake forecasts at subduction zones. Okay, so the next frontier, I've mostly been talking about data that is um, really onshore, based on these onshore GPS sites from the amazing GeoNet network, but because we don't really have the data offshore, we don't have much resolution of, to, about what's happening on that plate boundary offshore, just out right out here out this window. So we really kind of get need to get into the next frontier, and that's using seafloor instruments to try and resolve some of these processes. And as you can imagine, this is really technologically challenging. So it's, it's, this isn't a straightforward thing to do. Um, but we really do need to start trying to do this because we're sort of butting up against what, what do we really know about what's happening just out there. So um, how do we do this? Um, to, we're, well, in New Zealand, we're starting to use two major ways. Um, one is these little guys up here on the left. Um, these are actually seafloor pressure sensors. So what we do is we drop them off of a ship. Um, we use the Tangaroa, Niwa's Tangaroa a lot for this. And they sit on the seafloor for about a year or two, and they have pressure sensors on them. And they're recording the pressure d exerted on the, sea on the sensor by the overlying water column. So you can imagine if you have a slow slip event or an earthquake and the seafloor goes up, you have less water above you, so your sensor will record a pressure decrease. Likewise, if the seafloor goes down, you have more water above you, it records a pressure increase. So this actually allows us to map out this sort of upward and downward movement of the seafloor at a centimeter level with these seafloor pressure sensors. So we actually did this for the first time, um, demonstrated for the first time ever that this works in an experiment offshore the Gisborne region. We deployed about 25 of these instruments. Um, in 2014, and we got super lucky because they were out when there was a really big granddaddy slow slip event, which was exactly what we wanted. <laughs> so we wanted to see if this worked, and we recorded between one and five centimeters of uplift of the seafloor over where the slow slip was happening offshore Poverty Bay. And we saw that that slow slip went almost all the way out to the trench where the, the two plates meet at the seafloor, which was also very exciting. That was the first time um, that, that um, anyone had documented that these things could actually go all the way out to the trench. One of the other techniques that we're gonna, that we've just started using, and we've actually deployed one of these just offshore here, off Hawks Bay, right out near the trench, our seafloor transponders that we put, you put on the seafloor and you survey them in periodically with either with a ship, or with a, a wave glider or a buoy or some other type of system. And you can actually get the position of the array of transponders to within about a centimeter. And so the horizontal position. So it's very similar to the way that we do things with GPS on land. We can actually track the movement over time, how, how these sites are moving, and we can get a better idea 
of where offshore the plates are actually locked up and building up stress that could be released in future earthquakes and potentially generate tsunami versus where they're creeping. Um, so these are some of our ongoing efforts in terms of putting out, um, we're over the next few years, putting the seafloor pressure sensors out all the way from Gisborne down to Hawke's Bay. And then also we have deployed an array of these GPS acoustic to transponders to look and see if we do actually have the plates locked together off Hawke's Bay and then also off the Guadalapa coast. And we hope to do more and more of this in the future because I think this really is the future of figuring out what's going on out there. And this is um, largely funded by the MB Endeavor Fund and, um, and a lot of collaboration with our U.S. and Japanese partners. Okay, so I've only got a couple of minutes left. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to very quickly also talk about a project that I've been involved in that some of you might have heard about. Um, we had a, a, a big drill ship from the U.S. It was a, a scientific ocean drilling vessel, part of the International Ocean Discovery Program, um, where we undertook drilling offshore of Gisborne. And this was to try and better understand what causes these slow slip events or, or slow slip earthquakes to happen. Um, so because slow slip earthquakes are such a recent discovery, scientists still don't really know why they happen. Um, a lot of some of the most popular theories are that like water and fluids in the fault zone may promote these type of behavior or that the frictional properties of the rocks, the, the rock properties may promote slow slip behavior, but we don't really know yet. And Gisborne actually, offshore Gisborne actually presents probably well, it, I would argue the best place in the world to answer a lot of these questions because, as I showed you earlier, with the seafloor pressure sensors, we found that the slow slip goes almost all the way out to the trench. So these are actually the world's shallowest slow slip earthquakes. Most other places in the world where these things happen, they're occurring much deeper, 20, 30, 40 kilometers deep. But we can get really close to these things, and we can actually drill into the seafloor and get rocks out that are actually involved in this slow slip and test a lot of these ideas and really figure out why these things happen. So we did two drilling expeditions. This is the, the Joides Resolution up here on the right um, in late uh, 2017 and also in earlier in 2018. Um, we did a variety of things. The first expedition, we collected ge what we call geophysical logging data to try and get at the properties of the rocks in the boreholes. Um, and then in the second expedition, we actually acquired cores um, in the boreholes and also installed two observatories beneath the seafloor to kind of monitor what's going on in the crust during these slow slip cycles. So this is the area that we drilled. We drilled at four sites. So um, should have zoomed out more on this map, but Gisborne and Poverty Bay are about right over here. Um, so these, these stars here are the sites we drilled. Two of the sites were on the subducting Pacific plate. So the plate that's kind of coming into the slow slip area, the rocks on that plate are actually being transported into the slow slip zone. We drilled through one of the main active faults right out near the trench here, right out near the, the plate boundary. And then we also drilled a site that um, directly above the really large patch of slow slip. So this is just some pictures of some of the cores that we got um, from the drilling expedition. Um, particularly the most spectacular, these on the right, were actually from these two sites on the subducting Pacific plate. We were really amazed by the, the diversity of the different rock types that, we, that, that are coming into the subduction zone system, into the slow slip area. And we think that a lot, that the heterogeneity and the diversity of these different rock types that are caught up in that slow slip zone are probably playing a really big role in promoting this slow slip type behavior. Um, and we were also drooling over some of these would be really nice kitchen bench tops, but those, those would be, <laughs> that ships, you know, probably about $100,000 a day, it would be really expensive kitchen bench tops. So, um, <laughs> and since Alan was talking about turbidites, and uh, the potential for turbidites to, to improve our understanding of the record of past earthquakes. This is one of the others. These are some cores from the site where we drilled through the fault zone. And um, we saw hundreds of turbidites in these cores. Um, I know the turbidite freaks were all excited. I was just like, oh, man, another turbidite. But, um, <laughs> but um, as you can see, this is the, 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 the base. I guess the base of the turbidite. I hope I'm right, Alan. <laughs> and also there's some interesting um, tephra and ash. So actually we get ash and tephra from, from eruptions in the Taupo volcanic zone and some of these cores as well. So we may actually get a really nice record of the volcanic history in the central North Island, um, as well as learning about the, um, the, the plate boundary out here offshore. 
Okay. Um, and then finally, we also installed observatories um, offshore. So the two observatories went down, uh, we installed them down to about 500 meters beneath the seafloor. They have a whole bunch of different types of instruments in them to measure the kind of straining, the creaks and groans of the crust during the slow slip events and between the slow slip events, as well as changes in temperature and the flow of fluids and water through the fault zone. And these will be in place for um, really at least a decade and we hope actually longer if we can replace the instrument packages and keep them going for, for quite a long time. So this is the one through the main active fault zone, one of the main active faults here. And then this one here is overlying the area of really large slow slip. So it's about four or five kilometers above that area of really large slow slip. So these observatories, um, I'm, if you can't tell, I'm really excited about it, but <laughs> they're, they're really going to give us an unprecedented kind of front row seat to see what's happening in the Earth's crust during these slow slip events like we've never had before. Um, we're only going to be a few kilometers from where all the action is happening, and um, so I just hope they work. <laughs> we're probably going to go head out early next year and, and try and get the first round of data from them. We actually have to visit them with an underwater robot and plug into it and download the data. So um, that, that'll be pretty cool, too. So I'm going to move on to Dan. OK. Uh, so I'm just going to conclude this whirlwind tour by describing some of the seismic initiatives that we've been carrying out over the last 12 months to really get at the why aspect of what's driving some of these intriguing along margin differences and slip behaviour that Laura has just described. I've added even more logos to our cast of collaborators. Um, these seismic experiments, they involve lots of people. In this instance, we had two ships operating in tandem, uh, and we also used a lot of very sophisticated equipment from New Zealand, Japan, and the States. And so we're very lucky to have interested such a large global team in the Hikarangi margin. So why are they interested? Well, as Laura described, it really represents our best natural laboratory to really try and understand how the physical properties of subduction zones and different geological processes impact earthquake behaviour and tsunami. So the goal of our seismic experiments, we really had three goals. The first was to collect uh, geologic, geophysical data along the Hikarangi margin so that we could start to look at what geological processes are causing the southern region to lock up, whereas the northern region appears to creep. Uh, we also wanted to collect a margin crossing transect between Gisborne and Fakatane to image the deeper portion of the subduction zone and some of the geological processes happening beneath the axial ranges there. And then we also undertook an ultra high resolution 3D imaging experiment offshore Gisborne in this region uh, of IODP drilling and shallow slow slip. Uh, so in terms of the different techniques that we employ to image these different portions of the plate boundary, they really have their best analogues with different branches of medical imaging. We've already heard about CAT scans. This is a device which is used to take a CT scan, uh, and this is built up by taking many, many X-ray measurements in lots of different directions through a particular patient, and then using a computer to splice those together into a cross-sectional or 3D image. The main difference with the techniques that we employ is that we use seismic images which propagate through the earth uh, as opposed to x-rays. For both types of imaging, the, the level of detail that you can actually resolve is to a large extent determined by the number and the, the distribution of rays that you can pass through the particular medium that you're trying to image. The reason that a CT scan can produce such fabulous detail is because uh, this donut enables x-rays to be taken uh, in lots of different directions with near perfect coverage and in very large numbers. We unfortunately can't put the Hikarangi margin in a device like this and so we have to work rather much harder to record enough data to construct our images. Uh, we do this by uh, deploying seismometers on land and also on the seabed and these record seismic energy from naturally occurring earthquakes. In the oceans, we can actually generate very small amounts of seismic energy by using a ship which releases uh, pulses of compressed air. That generates energy which travels down through the earth, bounces back up to the surface off different rock layers, uh, and that in turn is recorded by our seismographs onshore in the ocean, and then also by uh, arrays of receivers towed behind the ship. 
Finally, on land, if we need to generate seismic energy, we can do this by drilling shallow boreholes and then detonating dynamite shots. Uh, so the Shire experiment uh, took its inspiration from Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was really designed around filling a couple of pretty glaring gaps that we had in terms of the data that we had available to, to look at some of these processes happening along the Hikarangi margin. You can see the most obvious of these is around this really fundamental transition that Laura has just described between the southern portion where the plate interface is very strongly locked and the region to the north where it's creeping. So the first phase of this was very much focused uh, around uh, Gisborne and the Raukuma Peninsula, and it involved deploying 90 seismometers. Uh, approximately half of these were in a regional distributed array to record earthquake arrivals. The other half were in a much denser coast-to-coast -coast transect between Gisborne and Whakatane. Phase two involved using the Niwa vessel Tangaroa to deploy 114 ocean bottom seismometers, these are, this is one of them here, uh, along three main transects. So the northern one of those was basically the offshore extension of this coast-to-coast -coast transect, both into the Bay of Plenty and then also offshore Gisborne. And then we also collected two extremely long profiles along the Hikarangi margin, which we hope will give us some insights into a long margin differences. Phase three involved the second ship. This is our friend, the Marcus G. Langseth from uh, the States. This left Portland, Auckland, and then spent 37 days snaking its way up and down the Hikarangi margin, uh, collecting 5,500 kilometres of extremely high-quality uh, seismic data. So this data, particularly, particularly in the region of the, the locking boundary, uh, will be really important uh, for our work. Phase two of Shire, which I'll touch on again a little bit later, involves reoccupying this coast-to-coast -coast transect, but deploying 900 seismographs between Whakatane and Gisborne, and then detonating five dynamite shots to, to generate our seismic energy. Uh, this is just an example of the data that we've caught, recorded by our array. This is one hour of data, and each of these stripes essentially represents energy from an earthquake propagating across all of the dif different instruments in our array. So it's very encouraging to see something like this because it shows that all of our hard work is paying off and we're recording useful data. To just uh, illustrate some of the, the work that we've been doing on the offshore data, I just thought I would focus on this big, long uh, transect line which is above the shallow portion of the Hikarangi margin. The data recorded by this line was recorded by 49 ocean bottom seismometers, and from the, those data we were able to make 170,000 unique measurements of the travel time that it would take seismic energy to travel from a particular offshore uh, air gun pulse to one of our receivers on, uh, on the seabed. So this is an incredibly dense data set and it gives us a, a fighting chance of actually being able to learn something about the Hikarangi margin. Um, so in terms of how we actually model these data, what we're trying to do is construct an Earth model which can best replicate those 170,000 travel time observations. This is an iterative process, and so we start by, divide, by uh, describing an extremely simple starting velocity model. I, I actually regret calling this bad because I think it's, it's quite good that this does such a poor job of fitting our, our data because it would be quite disappointing if we went to all this work and didn't learn anything new. So as we step through, uh, we make a series of improvements to the model, and we're starting to do a much better job of fitting the observations that we've actually made. We can put some labels on top of this. Uh, Cape Kidnappers, we're sitting here in Napier, Mahia Peninsula, and then Gisborne. This is Cape Turnagain, which Laura mentioned. Uh, the black line here actually represents the depth to the subduction interface. So this is, uh, the, uh, above this line we have uh, the Australian crust, and underneath that we have the subducting Pacific plate. What's really intriguing about this uh, very early result is that we see a big difference in the nature of rock overlying the northern portion of the Hikarangi margin with what we see to the south. You see that approximately halfway between Cape Turnigan and Cape Kidnappers, we see a big difference which occurs over a distance of about 20 kilometres. The seismic velocity of these rocks is about 500 metres per second slower, um, and there's a range of reasons uh, why that should be the case. But the reason why we're interested in that 
is that the location of this boundary is actually extremely well correlated with where Laura, from her GPS observations, has recorded a difference in fault locking. So we have much faster velocities in the overthrusting plate where the, where the uh, subduction zone is locked, uh, and then a reduction which seems to correlate really well with this uh, reduction in the strength of the fault. Um, this is really exciting and it's exactly the sort of thing that we were hoping to record when we, when we collected this uh, data. We do have a little bit of work to do in terms of uh, understanding what's actually, what the physical mechanism is controlling this transition. As Laura mentioned, it could be related to excess fluids residing in the, the, the crust to the north. It could also represent uh, the subduction zone uh, exerting more stress into the, into the rocks overlying the southern portion of the margin. So we have a bit of work to do there, but this is a very early and tantalising observation of, of differences between the north and south. Uh, the second experiment I thought I would quickly touch on is just the NZ3D experiment. This is the ultra high resolution imaging that we carried out offshore Gisborne. Phase one involved deploying uh, those same ocean bottom seismometers, 100 of them in this case, in a really dense uh, array offshore Gisborne. We also deployed 195 onshore seismometers. Our friend the Marcus G. Langseth then came back out to sea for us and essentially spent 31 days circling this racetrack while towing four six kilometre long geophone streamers. And so this is building up an extremely high density 3D data set uh, with, with, with which we can use to look at the, the shallow portion of the subduction zone offshore Gisborne. This is a very preliminary uh, image of, of that data set. You can see it's, it's a 3D data set and so we can slice it and dice it in uh, any direction that we like and it provides really uh, stunning uh, images of both the stratigraphy, the faults in the upper plate and then also the subduction interface. So this 3D volume is centred on the IODP boreholes that Laura described and it really will provide unprecedented constraints on the structure of the margin and also the interplay between fluids and uh, the different slip phenomena that we observe. Um, so the, the last thing I'll touch on is just uh, Shire 2, which is reoccupying this coast-to-coast -coast transect between Gisborne and Whakatane. We'll be deploying 900 uh, seismometers and then carrying out uh, five shots within shallow boreholes. Uh, so this energy from the shots will travel down to the deeper portions of the subduction zone beneath uh, the Raukuma Peninsula and travel back up to the surface to be recorded by that dense seismometer array. So the cons consultation with communities, landowners, councils and iwi is very well advanced for this experiment and so all going well, it should hopefully take place uh, in the first couple, few months of next year. Uh, it's not the first time that we've carried out this sort of experiment. We actually did it in our own backyard across the southern portion of the subduction zone back in 2009. Uh, before we carried this out, we really didn't have good knowledge about the, the deeper portion of the subduction inter interface where we knew that it was strongly locked. So carrying out this experiment in the south really gave us a much more detailed picture on both the geometry of the subducting, uh, subducting plate. Uh, we also imaged a region of really low velocity and uh, fluid-rich sediments uh, above, uh, below the Tararua ranges where many of the upper crustal faults extend down uh, and intersect the subduction interface. And it also showed us that those slow slip events that Laura has just been talking about in this instance are occurring just where the Pacific Plate starts to dive down beneath the crust of the Australian Plate. So collecting this northern data set will really give us uh, a great opportunity to compare the deeper structure of faults where they're creeping versus interseismically locked in the south. Um, so just... I, I thought I would finish by showing where we're heading. As Kate mentioned, um, you know, we've heard a lot about the fantastic science and, and really interesting problems that we're wrestling with, but really what we're motivated by is improving the resilience of New Zealand communities to natural hazards. Um, so this is just showing some of the outputs which will come out from the seismic work over the next two years. And what you can see is that they map almost immediately across to improvements to things like the New Zealand seismic hazard model, the predictions that we can make of ground shaking, the tsunami hazard model, and it will also flow through GeoNet to a range of improvements in terms of their ability uh, to, to locate earthquakes uh, and do things like that. So 
I think now I pass on to Jim, who's going to... I think I was going to wrap up. Oh, you're going to wrap up? So just to kind of tie all this together, um, just there, there's some many really important and unique characteristics of the Hikarangi subduction zone. As Dan mentioned, this big contrast from locked in the south to mostly creeping in the north. Um, you know, that this makes it a really amazing natural laboratory to try and figure out what actually causes some subduction zones to lock up and then slip in earthquakes versus creep. And then also the really shallow slow slip we see off Gisborne. There's some amazing opportunities that the international community has really kind of realized. And um, this, the Hikarangi margin has become a bit of a hotbed for, for international scientists to, to come and um, to, to try and better understand, sub understand subduction zones by doing investigations here. And this has really attracted over $60 million New Zealand dollars of international science funding investment in trying to better understand our subduction zone. So I think we're really excited because of all these studies going on. I think over the next several years, we're going to have a really big step change in our understanding of this plate boundary that you guys are all living on. Um, and so hopefully we can come back in a few years' time and give you even more, more and better information since we're really just in the early stages of this. Um, there's several additional experiments that are going to be happening over the next couple of years. Dan mentioned the later phases of the Shire project. There's also a couple of U.S.-funded research cruises where they're going to deploy some instruments and, and um, try and better image and understand the plate boundary. Um, and the initial results are already coming in from our RODP drilling and the seismic experiments, but this is a lot of data to plow through, so this is, really is, we have to be kind of patient in science, and it's going to take really several years to pull everything we can out of it. Um, but together, all of these things, we hope that these results will help us to understand which parts of the subduction zones are the, the main areas we need to be concerned about for subduction earthquakes and tsunami generation, a better understanding, particularly through Kate and Alan's work, on how often these types of events might happen and what the impacts um, to New Zealand, particularly to the East Coast communities, could be. Um, so we're working really closely with East Coast Lab. A lot of you guys probably know Kate Borson um, and the East Coast Lab based at um, the Napier Aquarium. Um, and they've been doing a great job um, getting, getting out in the community and talking to people about some of the geohazards that we face. Um, so we're, we're really hoping that our science out, um, outcomes will really help to underpin um, development of better tsunami and earthquake scenarios that can be used in things like evacuation planning and, and civil defense and emergency management exercises, um, and also a better quantification of the seismic and tsunami hazard that can, can really underpin regional development planning. Um, our development of seafloor instrument capability, we hope, will position us to be able to start going down a road of having more permanent, continuous monitoring out there that we can actually use in real time to, 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 to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening out there and what that means for earthquakes. Um, and then also, um, Kate um, and, and, other, and has been working with others on our project to develop field trips and other educational opportunities for East Coast stool, schools to really try and inspire the next generation of scientists and, and get those, um, go, those guys interested in, in trying to better understand um, what shapes New Zealand. So now, Jim. <laughs> Okay, so um, firstly, as an emergency management practitioner, I think I'd just like to acknowledge the work that these scientists do. Um, they say that uh, you know, knowledge is power, and certainly what they're doing is helping us a lot. So thank you very much. And um, we're already starting to see the influence of some of the science that they're producing on work that we're undertaking in the sector, um, and obviously recent projects we're undertaking.